It's Friday, August 28th. This is the news on PBCJ. I'm Simone Absalom. Jamaica recorded 66 new COVID-19 cases in the last 24 hours, bringing the total to 1,870, the number of positive COVID-19 cases to the island. Health and Wellness Minister Dr. Christopher Tufton gave an update on Thursday during a virtual press briefing at the ministry's New Kingston offices. Jamaica has recorded 66, that's 66 new confirmed COVID-19 cases in the last 24 hours. The total number of confirmed positives now stands at 1,870. Of the new cases, 35 are females and 31 are males with ages ranging from 7 years to 88 years. They have addresses in Clarinon, 12, Kingston and St. Andrew, 32, St. Catherine, 14, Manchester 1, St. James 3, St. Mary 2, Westmoreland 1, and St. Anne 1. One of the new cases is imported from the a flight from Nicaragua. The remaining 65 are under investigation. And as you can um, imagine, having discovered or concluded on the test results, the contact tracing investigation would commence, but this would have been very, very re recent. So they are, the, the bulk of the numbers are under investigation. The classification at this time are 441 imported cases, 515 that are contacts of confirmed cases, 236 cases related to the workplace cluster in St. Catherine, 163 that are local transmission cases not epidemiologically linked, and 515 cases that are under investigation. Of the 1,870 confirmed COVID-19 cases recorded in Jamaica up to now, 45% uh, or 846 have recovered and have been discharged uh, from care. Uh, um, 71 cases or 3.8% have returned to their countries of origin and 19 cases or 1% have died. There has also been one coincidental death of a COVID-19 positive person. The minister reminded the public that most of the persons who are positive can recover at home. The fact that you're positive does not mean you have to go into a hospital. And indeed, the hospitals would be overwhelmed very quickly if we ever took that posture. And that's not the posture that is the standard posture globally. And now that we are living with COVID, and more people are getting it, it means more will have to recover at home. To the extent that persons cannot or do not have a home environment, we are making arrangements to place them in an institutional environment, government-secured institutional environment. And we have a number of them around the country, and we are putting additional numbers in place. Um, to the extent, however, that persons are ill, and in this instance, four persons are moderately ill, and the doctors can define what moderately ill is. Four are critically ill. Now look at the numbers. 933 with only, sorry, seven are moderate and four are critical. 11 of 933 that really, based on my interpretation here, requires monitoring in a way that says you may need a device in the hospital, not even the ventilator, because that's normally when people are critically ill and you need special care. The rest, for the most part, can recover at home. I raise the point as a point of emphasis to say to Jamaicans, COVID will be present in our population. It's likely to be more present in the future. And the response to it is to manage it in a way where Home recovery will become more standard practice than hospital recovery. Reports have been circulating that the University Hospital of the West Indies has reached its bed capacity due to the increased numbers of COVID-19 cases. This and other issues related to the hospital were addressed by Medical Chief of Staff at the hospital, Dr. Carl Bruce. Melvin Pennant has that report. Dr. Bruce gave an update on the number of COVID patients currently at the hospital. 
As of today, we have um, 23 active cases at the university. Um, four of those patients are critical, and one of the, those patients, one patient is intubated. But we also, as you know, test the patients who we admit as emergencies at the university. And that testing will yield, even though the doctors um, will go ahead and treat our emergency cases, the tests will sometime return positive. And so from time to time, you will have cases that are not on the COVID ward that's picked up by our screening tool. And so this evening we have um, three patients on the surgical wards um, that we are waiting to be transferred um, to the COVID area. We also have two patients in the emergency room who have tested positive and who will be admitted. As was outlined before, we are admitting to hospital only those cases who are, which are serious, um, obviously moderate or severe cases, but cases that our specialists um, deem need to be in hospital, um, whether it be for supplemental oxygen and management, physiotherapy, etc. Dr. Booth also addressed a recent letter that was circulated by a group of doctors at the hospital, expressing concern about the capacity to deal with the surge. The letter from our doctors and, you know, whenever the, the clinicians at the university speak, we really listen to them. Um, we're very empathetic um, to them and we take them seriously. And, you know, I must say that we are humbled by their courage. We have been inspired by their compassion, and we are grateful for the service that they have given not only to the university, but to the Jamaican public. Um, in the initial part of, of the pandemic, um, about eight of our healthcare workers would have tested positive. Since um, the surge has occurred, or the increased number of cases, we have had about nine of our doctors test positive. We expect this number, unfortunately, to increase. As we said, we don't deny care to our patients, and therefore, w when we admit the emergencies, even though we are going to take care to ensure that all possible precautions um, are taken and that we test them as, as best as we possibly can, that delay between testing, getting back the result, and the doctors treating or doing emergency surgery is going to re result in a period of exposure that we cannot control. And so as the number of cases increase, we would expect that more of our healthcare workers are going to be affected. We have met with the, the, the residents and we have met with the heads of department, the CEO, the head of HR, um, the, the legal officer, and the residents themselves and the, the head of department, Professor Boyne. And as the number of cases increase, we know that we have to reinforce these teams. And we have that plan um, that's there to reinforce the team. And we, in some instances, will have to ask the other specialties to help with their patients as we go forward. Dr. Bruce said that the hospital will also be activating areas that have already been retrofitted to care for COVID-19 patients. Melvin Pennant, PBCJ News. The current surge in COVID-19 cases has seen the emergence of two parishes as potential hotspots, and they are Kingston and St. Andrew, as well as St. Catherine. Chief Medical Officer Dr. Jacqueline Bessessi mckenzie provided a breakdown of the cases for the parishes. Persons right across Kingston and St. Andrew must take the necessary precautions and adhere to the rules and policies that are in place in workplace and all over to ensure that they decrease the, their risk of infection. These are the areas that we are, have noticed that there is an increase in the number of cases, and we're talking about Barbican in the Constance Spring area, Duane Park area, notice that we're seeing lately an increase in the number of cases in the Mona area as well, and of course, Patrick Gardens and those areas in the Greater Duhaney Park, du Greater Duhaney Developmental Area. So this is what the cases, this, this is where the spread of cases lie. And so again, we can't ask enough for persons to take the necessary precautions. With general elections less than a week away, one of the concerns that Jamaicans think of is voting during pandemic. The Director of Elections, Glasgow Brown, addressed the health and safety concerns as the country prepares to go to the polls. 
our approach and the posture that we take on election day that we, we, we are assuming that everybody that enters that polling station location is COVID positive. And therefore, starting from that base, we have decided to, to, to put in place a number of protocols to deal with the issue. We have sought to recruit in excess of 7,400 persons and we have put them into our team known as the sanitization team. Those 7,400 persons will spread across the 2,200 polling station location on, on election day. That team is geared towards ensuring that every person who enters our polling station location has on a mask. And also they, that team will ensure that everybody who enters through that gate is sanitized and their temperature is taken and then they are ushered into the polling station. For all workers, the work, workers that will be using in, in excess of 20 or 1,000 persons, every worker will have on a mask, they'll also have on a face shield and also they'll be given a, the necessary sanitizing liquid to, to keep that process going to the day. So what will happen when, when, that, when, when the elector enters the gate and again, I just urge everybody who is listening, ensure that when you come to the polling station that you have on a mask. Um, there are persons who might ask whether why the EOJ or ECJ does not provide masks. Um, on, the, on the list itself has 1.9 million person. It's impossible for us to provide that. So therefore we urge everybody to come to the polling station and have a, wearing a mask. When you enter that gate, you'll be ushered into the polling station. What will happen is that on approaching the presiding officer, you'll be asked to temporarily remove your mask just for a couple of seconds for the presiding officer, officer can do the necessary identification check. Then you'll be asked by the presiding officer to, 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 to replace your mask again, to put back on your mask. The presiding officer will then give you certain instruction. That instruction will include how to mark the ballot and they will direct you behind the voting booth. The offices of the National Council for Senior Citizens located at 11 West Kings House Road in Kingston is closed to the public to facilitate deep cleaning and sanitization. The Ministry of Labor and Social Security says the council will resume normal operations to the public on Monday, August 31. The ministry also advised that its offices in St. Thomas, Kingston and St. Andrew and St. Catherine will be closed to the public at 4 p.m. daily until Wednesday, September 2. Two confirmed cases of COVID-19 are employees of the National Water Commission. One is a water truck driver in Montego Bay, St. James, and another employee from the Transport Department Operations Division at Morosco Road in St. Andrew. The National Water Commission, NWC, says measures have been taken to mitigate the spread of the virus based on the health ministry protocols. All operations at the NWC Transport Department have been suspended. The commission notes that the transport department is separated from the commercial offices at the Morosco Road location. As such, their commercial offices remain safe and will continue to serve their valued customers. However, customers are encouraged to use their online portal as an alternative. 67 cannabis licenses have been issued to local companies and individuals since its establishment in 2015. Director of Research, Development and Communications at the Cannabis Licensing Authority, Felicia Bailey, made the disclosure at a recent Jamaica Information Service think tank session. We get more in this report from Marlon Samuels. According to Ms. Bailey, the CLA has also issued 315 conditionally approved licenses from the 712 applications received since the authority's establishment in 2015. This is the stage where the authority allows the applicant sufficient time to put in place the requisite infrastructure to support the granting of the respective license. A pre-licensing inspection is usually done by our enforcement and monitoring division and this is to verify the suitability of the site before the granting of that license. However, at this stage, we have a major challenge which confronts applicants, and that is the issue of banking. When I, when I say banking, I mean access to funding to facilitate their build-out. 
And this is because there are banking issues for the cannabis industry globally. This is because bank, banks are doing what we call de-risking to preserve their corresponding bank relationships, mainly in the United States. Ms. Bailey said the authorities committed to facilitating the growth and development of the industry. The CLA makes every effort on its part to facilitate the growth of the industry, and this includes the use of Regulation 32.1 of the interim regulations, and this now permits the CLA, with the prior approval of the minister, after consulting with the Minister of Finance, to grant waivers, deferments, or permit payment plans for persons or companies who have difficulty paying the license fees and security bonds charged by the CLA. The CLA is an agency under the portfolio of the Ministry of Industry, Commerce, Agriculture and Fisheries that was established in 2015 under the Dangerous Drug Amendment Act. Its specific role is to establish and regulate Jamaica's legal cannabis and hemp industry. For the news on PBCJ, I'm Marlon Samuels. We now look at the latest stock prices and other markets data. Gabriel Thompson has the business report. Bank of Jamaica Governor Richard Biles says public concerns and anxiety about the movement of the exchange rate is understandable. Despite this, the governor says the central bank will only intervene if disorderly movements are seen or expected that could threaten the inflation target. On August 12, the Jamaican dollar crossed the threshold of $150 to one U.S. dollar. The reason for the weaker Jamaica dollar, ladies and gentlemen, is the significant reduction in the availability of U.S. dollar inflows into the system due primarily to the sudden stop in tourist arrivals since the onset of COVID-19 in Jamaica at the end of March this year and the slow recovery in the sector since the reopening of our borders in mid-June. We note that remittance inflows have been particularly strong, growing by approximately 42 percent, uh, and this has cer certainly helped liquidity in the market. However, there was a pickup in foreign exchange demand in August when compared to the previous month, and this has led to an adjustment in the exchange rate. Just over 700 million U.S. dollars in foreign currency liquidity has been provided by the BOJ for support to the market. Bank of Jamaica sold U.S. 30 million to the market on the 18th of August so as to ensure continued orderly adjustments in the exchange rate. We also offered a U.S. dollar index bond to investors seeking a hedge against future exchange rate movements. This comes on the heels of several prior initiatives to provide extra liquidity to the foreign exchange market since March of this year, including BFixit flash sales, direct sales to players in the energy sector, extending an, a foreign exchange swap arrangement, providing a US dollar repurchase facility and reducing the foreign currency cash reserves held by DTIs. Speaking Wednesday at the BOJ's quarterly policy press conference, Mr. Biles reaffirmed that the central bank has enough U.S. dollars in reserve. Bank of Jamaica continues to monitor developments in the foreign exchange market, and we will work closely with authorized dealers and cambios to ensure the smooth and orderly functioning of the market. If necessary, BOJ will, will act using both monetary policy and foreign exchange operations to ensure that movements in the exchange rate do not affect our inflation target. Let me emphasize, ladies and gentlemen, with gross reserves of 3.7 billion US dollars, Jamaica is in a stronger position than in previous crises. These reserves, if judiciously managed, will be adequate to see us through this temporary crisis. Mr. Biles also said the BOJ is focused on ensuring low and stable inflation. In light of these circumstances, Bank of Jamaica has maintained its accommodative monetary policy stance. 
aimed at encouraging and supporting a speedy economic recovery once this crisis has passed. We will remain focused on ensuring that inflation remains low, stable, and predictable within the target range of 4 to 6 percent, while standing ready to deploy additional measures as needed to ensure the continued smooth flow of liquidity to all participants in the financial system. In Thursday's trading session, the JSE combined index declined by 1,888 points to close at under 400,000 units. Overall, market activity resulted from trading in 81 stocks, of which 29 advanced, 40 declined, and 12 traded firm. The junior market index declined by 28 points to close at under 3,000 units. Stocks advanced for 138 Student Living Jamaica, 1834 Investments Limited, and Blue Park Group Limited. Stocks declined for AMG Packaging and Paper Company, Barita Investments Limited, and Berger Paints Jamaica. Trading firm were Cargo Handlers Limited, Caribbean Producers Jamaica, and Honeybun Limited. Wigdon Wind Farm Limited Ordinary Shares was the volume leader with 5.5 million units, followed by QWI Investments Limited with 2.1 million units, and Trans Jamaican Highway Limited with just over 1.3 million units. Now for the foreign exchange. The U.S. dollar on Thursday, August 27, ended trading at $150.04. The Canadian dollar sold for an average $114.94. The pound sterling traded for $199.39 and the euro ended trading at $181.60. Oil prices edged lower on Friday as Storm Laura passed the heart of the U.S. oil industry in Louisiana and Texas without causing any widespread damage to refineries. Brent crude futures gained $0.10 cents to $45.19 a barrel. West Texas intermediate crude futures rose $0.20 cents to $43.24 a barrel. That's it for the Business Report on PBCJ. I'm Gabrielle Thompson. And now for an update on the entertainment scene. Let's find out what's happening from Alicia Steele with the Entertainment Recap. The coronavirus shakes up local entertainment industry. Spy showers sun with gifts and lots more. I'm your host, Alicia, and welcome to Entertainment Recap. World's fastest man Usain Bolt contracts the deadly coronavirus in the same period of celebrating his 34th birthday on August 21st. And for many, it's how he celebrated it was the problem. His partner, Casey B, held a surprise birthday shing-ding amid the COVID-19 outbreak, which was deemed as irresponsible. Criticism started early when information circulated that our very own Usain Lightning Bolt was having a birthday bash, even as the nation was seeing a second spike in COVID-19 cases prior to date. Guests at the party were a who's who's of local celebrities and entertainers from footballers, socialites, dancers, and musicians. Dancehall artist Ding Dong, who performed, shared a video of the celebration to his Instagram page. I mean, inside, inside. But caption his post, throwback Fridays to last year at my bro at Usain Bolt breakfast B-Day party kept by his wife at KCB. <laughs> the absence of mask and lack of social distance with dozens of guests presents were the main issues for people or local people, several of whom tag Prime Minister Andrew Holness and Health Minister Dr. Christopher Tufton in the video shared by others on Twitter. Usain had this to say. Just waking up, um, like everybody has checked social media, saw that social media saying I'm confirmed to have COVID-19. Um, I did a test on Saturday to leave because I work uh, trying to be responsible so I'm going to stay in and stay for my friends and also I'm um, having no symptoms so going to quarantine myself um, 
and wait on the confirmation to see what is the protocol and how shall I go about quarantining myself from the Ministry of Health. So until then, uh, talk to all my friends and tell them that they may come in contact with me. Should just to be safe, quarantined by yourself and just to take it easy. And just to make people know, be safe out there. All right? Tadine Hilton, otherwise known as Miss Kitty, lost her father on August 18, and we would like to remind you all to keep her in your prayers as we, the PBCJ family, prays for her health and strength. Miss Kitty wrote via an Instagram post, Daddy, this was not the news we were hoping for as we thought you would pull through again. I'm heartbroken and numb. You got the best care and were well taken care of and that gives me some solace during this very sad time. God know I'm feel sick and weak at the same time. I'm still processing what has happened, but the tears have not stopped. I ask God for strength and courage for our family. Rest well, Daddy. Kindly keep my family in your prayers." End quote. Now we've come to an end of PBCJ's Entertainment Recap. I'm your girl, Alicia. Follow us on all socials at PBC Jamaica, that is. Special thanks to Air Candy for this African piece, It Nice Bad. And follow them on their Instagram page at the Air Candy Collection. Just remember, always and forever, big up who you. In regional news, the Trinidad and Tobago Electricity Commission has refuted claims that it is not treating the COVID-19 pandemic seriously. The T-Tech workers are demanding that the company's management be forthright with them concerning possible COVID-19 infections at the workplace. Crystal Wilson reports. T-Tech Distribution North branch of the OWTU, Kevin Julian, said the workers refused to enter the workplace and opted instead to wait outside the compound, demanding answers concerning other members of staff who have been required to self-quarantine. This morning, the workers at Distribution North, Rison Road 35, we are demanding that managers come out and answer some of our questions. Questions being, what do they have in place to protect employees from COVID-19? Yesterday, seven Tiantec police officers were showing flu light symptoms and information this morning that they are self quarantined. Mr. Julian said an agreement had been signed off by both management and OWTU, which stipulated that only 50% of workers report for duty every week. But this agreement, Mr. Julian said, has been broken by Tiantec as 100% of workers have been on the job. They tend to be told nobody ain't dead and if you want to keep your work, come to work. And these are some of the things disrespectful managers will say to employees when they ask questions about their own health and safety. Responding via a press release, TNTech said like many companies in Trinidad and Tobago, the commission continues to face challenges associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. The release added that ill-advised persons have found it necessary to release what the company describes as erroneous statements to the public, which suggests the commission has treated with COVID-19 related issues without urgency and in a relaxed manner. The commission said it cannot ignore such attacks and stated emphatically that it follows all public health protocols, which includes contacting the Ministry of Health. Crystal Wilson, TTT News. There is a new bus system on trial in St. Kitts as officials attempt to improve efficiency and fair distribution of jobs. The details in this report. Westline Bus Association and the Traffic Department are currently collaborating on a new operational routine for implementation at the new bus terminal in downtown Barstair. On Wednesday, 26 August, buses were seen in the terminal facing east rather than the usual westward facing exit. The new system for bus operations in the terminal is an initiative of the Westline Bus Association. According to Nicholson Rambo Webster, the president of the Westline Bus Association, the new method is on trial run aimed at improving efficiency and providing an equitable distribution of jobs 
as the new terminal gets ready for formal commissioning. Well, the new, the new terminal will serve not only, remember, we didn't have anything in terms of protection from the sun, uh, rain or anything like that, and the space needed to be upgraded. So, but what we want to happen is an, not only a new terminal, but an efficient system that everybody can benefit equally. We don't want the popular guys to be the one who just making, you know, a living, and the other guys who are not so popular have difficulties making a living. So we want a system that can work equ equitable for everybody. Meanwhile, officers of the police traffic department were on site providing assistance and advice as the new system was monitored. Speaking with SK Newsline, police inspector at the traffic department explains the process. They did a dry run, and that is the reason why you see um, no markings, no kind of markings on the road as yet. It is a dry run just to see how we could actually tweak, you know what I mean, as we go along. You understand me? Nothing is set in stone. You know what I mean? the best interest for the, the public and for motorists, uh, including the, the bus drivers, the West bus drivers. And the loading area is to pick up only. So, buses in the waiting area, this is the middle section, is the waiting area. So, buses here, they can actually have bed door open also. But they cannot leave until the four buses to the front is already filled. They reach a capacity. So, when they move on, buses here will be moving maybe every three minutes or something like that. Yeah, I mean, it could be less. So, when they move on, the next four buses come up, yeah, get filled. If you love a bus, I see a bus that marks Solar Flex. If you love Solar Flex, you can sit in Solar Flex once you have the time. If you have to work for 8 30, you can sit in Solar Flex maybe from you know, maybe whatever time until you think that you will reach up to the, um, the loading area so that they could actually proceed. Buses from the eastern bus line can drop off passengers on the southern side of the terminal, but it is not an area for waiting for passengers. The inspector indicated that problematic issues will be discussed with the Western Bus Line to arrive at a solution. Glenn Bart, SKN Newsline. In sports, there are concerns about the absence of Inter-Secondary Schools Association school boy football season and its effect on the final year students who are hoping to be able to showcase their talents for colleges overseas. Head coaches Ludlow Bernard of Kingston College and Christopher Bender of Camperdown High voiced their concern to the press recently following ISA's announcement Monday of the cancellation of school sports for the upcoming Christmas term. The decision is made because of the delay in the phased reopening of schools following a surge in novel coronavirus cases in the island. Bernard, who helped Kingston College capture the 2019 ISA Champions Cup, said that while the majority of his young squad are already looking forward to next year, the cancellation will affect final year students who are hoping to use the season to earn college scholarships. And that's the news on PBCJ. Thank you so much for watching. Remember, PBCJ, we are the people's station.